guys, I trust you've been staying safe. This true crime story is coming to you from Zambia in Africa, specifically from a district called the Mumba District. It's barely over 24 hours ago since this story broke and already two lives have been lost. There is total chaos and routing. Some institutions have been set on fire, vehicles and other properties vandalized and security forces attacked. But what triggered all these is going to be the focus of this true crime story. And when we are done, you let me know in the comment section if you've seen versions of these things playing out in your communities, irrespective of whichever country you find yourself in whilst watching this. I am in Africa and the dynamics of this story are not too strange based on certain things I've heard occurring in some neighboring African countries and sometimes even suspected to be occurring in mine. What happened? Well, two prominent millionaires, or dare I say billionaires, in Zambia have been well, unalived. What happened? The first person is in the person of Sika Onga Ernest. And he has a nickname, Yakaipa. So if you get to Zambia and you mention the name Yakaipa, everybody knows who this person is. He's a businessman with a fleet of trucks and a chain of companies who employs over a hundred employees and does so much charity for the community. He is beloved by a lot of people. And then the second person is a very close friend of his by name David Wakiyoma. Let me take the name again. David Wakiyoma. Now, David Wakiyoma is also a very successful businessman and a close friend of Sikaonga Ernest, aka Yakaipa. But then, whilst Yakaipa or Sikaonga Ernest is a Zambian, his friend David Wakiyoma is a Tanzanian. So, the question is still lingering that why were these guys unalived and who even unalived them? Now, let's get into the issues. Less than 24 hours ago, or let's throw back over a week ago, the lifeless body of a man was found as the morning broke and questions were coming up as to what accounted for this man being found unalive on the streets because not only was he dead but then it was obvious to the ordinary man that he had been cut open and allegedly some vital organs of his had been taken out of him including allegedly his private parts now reports indicated that it looked like this was done surgically because you could see the precision. I've had the opportunity to see some of these pictures, but unfortunately, I can't share them here because of YouTube graphic content policy. So when these things started manifesting, residents in the community became alarmed and rightly so because we all go to bed hoping to wake up to a much more beautiful day than the one we just went through. So you can appreciate the terror residents would face when they wake up in the morning to meet a lifeless body of a man with marks and cuts seemingly done surgically to remove vital organs. The police came in, did their work, took the body away and as investigations were ongoing, you could tell tensions were brewing in the community. It didn't take long. Just less than a week after that, a second body was found. Now, this second person was also observed to have ended up in the same way as the first person. The name of the first victim that was found was Wea Kashiweka. Sorry if you are not so familiar with the names. These are typical 
Zambian names. So the first victim was Wea Kashweka. He was the first to be found with these surgical incisions made on him and his vital organs reportedly cut out. The second victim they found is another man who was reportedly in his early 40s by the name Joseph Miyatu. Now, if you look at Joseph Miyatu, you can tell that this is not a man who could easily be overpowered without a fight. So it's either he was subdued by more than one person or probably he was injected something or administered something that made him docile and easy to be overpowered even by one person. Either way, Joseph Miyatu was also found less than one week after Wea Kashweka had been found all in a similar state where they had been suspiciously ripped open and vital organs allegedly taken out. So this was the MO now. Going back to how traumatized the community was when they first saw the first victim, seeing the second victim, Joseph Miyatu, on that fateful morning, triggered riots. The people in the community felt that they had to take a stand because not only was it bad that it happened the first time, but it was unimaginable that it has happened a second time, which meant to them probably that it had taken roots in their community and if they don't take action, it was going to fester because then you don't know who is next. So, I agree with the concerns of the community on that. And sometimes when these things happen, people sometimes begin to lose confidence in the police when it happens for the second time because ideally they are expecting that the first time was bad enough and should have been enough for the police to sort it out, investigate and close the case and arrest all the perpetrators. So if it happens a second time, there is a tendency for people to feel like we need to go vigilante and take the law into our hands and quash this. And that is what triggered this rioting. It is reported that a suspect was actually picked up at a factory or a warehouse which was close to where the body of the second victim, Joseph Miyatu, was found. So this person who was picked up was allegedly a security officer and he was taken to the police station for questioning. This information got round and allegedly a mob came together started the rioting and headed to the police station demanding that that suspect be released to them for questioning. This is the point where the law comes into conflict with triggered emotions of sometimes residents in a community which are being fooled by fear, ignorance, lack of knowledge and sometimes pure rage as to what has been done to a loved one. And with all this played out, it wasn't going to go well because the police also per their jurisdiction will not release the suspect to that mob. Because if they do, they are equally complicit in any other thing that will follow afterwards. So they also refused and tried to calm the mob down and as is expected, the mob were angry and already incited by what had happened so they were not in a position or in the mood to be compromised by the police of the police. So, it escalated quickly and it became a give and take where the police now had to fend off the mob who were trying to force their way in to get the suspect. The police were successful in defending their base and the mob left. You would think that this ends the issue or at least de-escalates the issue. But little did the police know what was to come, would be so much worse than what they had just endured at the hands of the mob. Because the mob decided that, well, if we can't get the suspect, we are going on an expedition to the crime scene 
and we are going on an expedition to the location the suspect was picked from. And that was exactly what they did. They went to this warehouse, forced their way in, and started looking for anybody in there they can question. It seemed empty until they found the man. This man will turn out to be David Wakioma. Bear in mind, David Wakioma is the Tanzanian who is the friend of the Zambian millionaire, Sikaonga Ernest, aka Yakaipa. So they found David Wakioma in this warehouse and they confronted him. Initially, David denied having any idea what had happened to that deceased person who had his organs seemingly cut out surgically. But it's reported that the mob pressed on and at a point, David Wakiyoma confessed that he knows about what happened and the guy was well, unalived for the purposes of harvesting his organs. That is the report out there. But, you know, David Wakiyoma is not here to give a side of the story. Like I've been saying in some of my videos, the dead can't speak for themselves. That is the unfortunate part sometimes. But this is the report out there that David confessed. At which point, the mob pounced on him, attempting to administer instant justice. Bear in mind that they've already had a first battle with the police. So if they have found their suspect now, who has actually allegedly confessed, imagine how difficult a time the police will have to fight this mob to get to the suspect that the mob has in their hands now. So as this was escalating, the police got wind of it and decided to also make strides to get in and save David from the mob. But before the police could get there, the mob questioned David further, trying to find out from him who his accomplices were because it turns out that the warehouse in which David had been apprehended by the mob actually allegedly belonged to Sikaonga Ernest aka Yakaipa. So you see the trajectory the case is evolving to. So then they asked David again, who are your accomplices? To which point, after being administered some physical attacks and some heckling, of course, David told them that, yeah, I have a second person here and he is the owner of the building and he's in the person of Sikaonga Ernest, a.k.a. Yakaipa. All these are the alleged stories out there. And they asked where this millionaire was and he told them that he was hiding in a tunnel within the warehouse. So, this is where it gets even shadier. The warehouse has a tunnel. Who does that? Is it like a front for something else? I'll come to that when I'm adding my two cents. So the mob then proceeded to now start searching for this person and this tunnel, whilst a section of it were also administering their instant justice to David Wakiyoma. So just like that, David Wakiyoma's life was coming to an end if the police wouldn't be able to make it there in time. The mob scattered the warehouse premises searching for this tunnel and the businessman and eventually it's reported that they found Sikaonga Ernest aka Yakaipa holed up in this so-called secret tunnel and apprehended him. They found allegedly some coffins in there and when they opened it, they allegedly found some harvested organs which they suspected belonged to the two victims that they had seen. Upon interrogation, it's alleged again that Sikaonga Ernest, aka Yakaipa, confessed that he was behind everything that they were seeing, at which point the mob 
pounced on him and also proceeded to administer their instant justice before the police could make their way and successfully get to these two people the mob had already dealt with them and ended their lives thus ends the life of zambian multi-millionaire sikaonga ernest aka yakaipa and his friend from tanzania david wakiyoma their lives were cut short at the hands of this mob and this case like i said is just about 24 hours old barely and is evolving escalating to serious routes vandalism and a whole lot of chaos in this district in zambia here comes my two cents now i'm not here to pass judgment i believe that there should be an investigation into all this there actually is one is ongoing as at the time i was making this video the police had come out to say that two suspects had already been arrested the minister of interior had visited the sites and everything so there's a lot of work ongoing as far as investigations are concerned but then my two cents first of all how do we corroborate the testimonies allegedly given by sikaonga and his friend david to this mob it becomes a problem when mob justice takes over the rule of law because if they, if 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 they had been subjected to the rule of law there would have been an inquiry investigation probably a court hearing something and then we get to find out what has happened what they did who are their accomplices because if indeed they are into this business then certainly there's going to be a tall chain of other people in that market there's going to be a middleman who is going to facilitate the transaction of they getting the organs they've allegedly harvested to the end user or the end supplier who will then also relay it on to the end user because if you are, if you don't know i know that there's a whole black market for the sale and purchasing of human organs or vital human organs for that matter there's a black market because these are not sanctioned by law and people go through all sorts of weird means to get some of these things because it pays a lot it pays a lot but the mob justice denied everybody the opportunity of getting to know what was actually going on and who or other which other people were part of this syndicate if there is even one at all because the mob justice just silenced them and in that moment i'm sure they felt that they've gotten the justice they are looking for but i think that in the medium to long term they've actually did an injustice to themselves whilst trying to find their justice because now you've silenced these two people assuming they are guilty of what you accuse them of you don't get the opportunity to get to find out who their other accomplices were these other accomplices if they are around will just move to a different zone or move to a new syndicate who are now going to find people whose life they will end and harvest their organs for them and the trade continues so in as much as they felt they've done some instant justice it's something that seems to just last in the short term it's more of an instant gratification but it doesn't actually solve the problem to its roots because the core of it may still be active but then to flip the coin why the mob justice and it's not uncommon here in africa to see things like this happening and mob justice taking over the rule of law and lynching people sometimes innocent people actually get lynched and it's it's very very unfortunate there are certain areas that all people are waiting to hear or all that would take to trigger people to lynch somebody is just for somebody to shout thief thief and somebody to start running you the guy who is running you automatically assume to be the thief and if you get caught you are not going to be 
most likely given the chance to speak or explain anything people just pounce on you with weapons and if you are not careful or if you are not lucky that might be the end of your life right there yeah it's that serious so why the need for the mob justice i don't condone it but sometimes you begin to understand why it's happened even though you don't appreciate why it should be happening i will explain Sometimes the mob actions are triggered by the lack of confidence in the security forces. And let's apply that suspicion or that theory to this case. The suspect is a multi-millionaire, Yakaipa. He has fleet of trucks and several employees who have dependents. He does a lot of charity. So obviously, he has money and power on his side. People might have thought that if we hand this guy over to the police, he may probably buy his way out. And that thinking may be fueled by the lack of trust for the police and the security forces, the lack of confidence in their ability to be professional, objective, and unbiased in the face of attempted influencing by several rich people. It might not be Akaipa himself, but maybe some associates of his. All these come into play. Some people even doubt their judicial systems in their own countries as to whether it can prosecute the rich and powerful. Some people believe that their judicial systems are only made to deal with those who are poor or less fortunate because they do not have the money and the power. But if you have money and power, the law can excuse you. These are things some people believe based on where they find themselves and sometimes all these culminate together with stupidity lack of knowledge and sometimes sensationalism and misguided anger which would then culminate into a situation where mob justice begins to look like an attractive solution for a problem but i don't condone it r.i.p to these two guys but then i think that This case has to be investigated to the latter. And the investigation shouldn't be just about the the mob action. It should be in two directions. What the mob is saying, what was found allegedly at the warehouse, and whether indeed these two people were, were doing what this mob is saying they were doing. So it becomes an investigation into two evils. One evil is already confirmed. That is the mob action leading to the death of these two people. The other evil is a suspicion that needs to be corroborated after an investigation or refuted. And I think that it's about time some of the police officers or policing institutions in some African countries try and do better and also get to a point where they can actually touch on the confidence that the people have in them positively. It gets to reduce some of these things because ideally if people believe in the justice system the judicial systems the policing and security systems in their country that it doesn't give biases to anybody irrespective of whether you are rich or poor the tendency of them to submit people arrested even per civilian arrests to the police will be very high or at least it would increase to a better level than it is now because when the law looks to have failed, vigilantism begins to look attractive. And I don't think that we need to let our systems break down to get to that point. So this is what has happened. And it's an ongoing case. RIP to these two people. And there's a narrative that is being pushed around that it's, he might not be the only African millionaire who is having suspicious means of funds. I'm sure most of you watching know about money laundering. Basically where you get money from illicit sources and then people try to legitimize it by funneling the money through businesses that they set up to make it seem like it's the businesses that are churning out these monies. Although these two are deceased, it still doesn't rule out the fact that what the mob is saying could be true. But then again, it could also be false. 
my heart goes out to their families and I still have to be objective and sit on the fence because there's a possibility it could be true such that these guys were into this particular business and it really pays. I don't know the rates and all but imagine how desperate people are with regards to the need for them to get an organ transplant to save a life of a loved one. People are ready to pay huge sums of hard cash just to get ahead. Because most often with the lists or the queue in the approved medical facilities or the, 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 the facilities approved by law, you may have to follow a long queue before you get the opportunity to get the organ that you need. So if you have a source on the black market who can cut corners and get you one, imagine the money people will be ready to pay for that. And then, if you are dealing in such a thing and you are getting people to patronize, imagine the kind of wealth such a person could accumulate, which then begins to look consistent with the fact that Yakaipa actually started business with nothing, nothing, and has grown to where he is. So that suspicion is there. At least some people have had it in mind. And you may know someone like that in your community. Somebody who rose from nothing to so much prominence and wealth. And you can't really put your finger on exactly what blew him up into so much wealth. But he always has a motivational story to tell. It doesn't mean the person did something fishy or is doing something fishy. But that question mark around the person creates room for doubts and also for suspicious stories to be believed by some people. That is the situation that the Yakaipa name or brand built by Sikaopa Ernest has now fallen into. But I'm hoping that after the investigations, we would see what it is and actually some people would even have confidence in the investigation. Honestly, looking at how some of these things play out in some African countries, I will be on the fence even after the findings of the investigation come out because most often, if it's about a rich and powerful person, you would find that there are levels to the case where other rich and powerful and influential friends of this person might try to influence even the narrative that the investigation will turn out. I'm not saying that will be the case here. I'm just saying that I will sit on the fence, irrespective of what the findings are. I've come here to let you what it, to let you know what it was, but I will still sit on the fence with regards to what I choose to believe. Subscribe to our channel, turn on post notifications, and hey, keep an eye out and stay safe out there.